friends, welcome to another edition of Tiffin Cast. Today we have Doug Boutwell, who's co founder and really the, the, the guy behind Totally Rad Actions and Presets. Um, Doug, welcome to the show. I know it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you're on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. We've tried to figure this out and we finally made it. So yeah, time zones are terrible, aren't they? I know, they're horrible, horrible things. Um, I want to first congratulate you on Replichrome because it is, it is really uh, the first presets that I think I'm going to be using uh, in Lightroom, to be honest with you. I've used others, but this is, mm -hmm. these are presets that have enabled me to actually work on images versus, I don't know how to put it, um, I've used others. And I always wanted to undo them and sort of mm -hmm. work on my own. Yes. Replichrome, on the other hand, seems to, on the get-go, have a have a great start, like a great starting place. Is that is that what you intended to do? It is, yeah. I mean, um, listening to what people wanted. I mean, we started off making uh, actions that would do these kind of wild things to your photos. Um, but the ones that we constantly heard people saying that they really were gravitating towards and using all the time were, and what's the novelty of, uh, like, this looks like a 19th century, you know, wet plate photo. Once the novelty of that kind of wore off, people just really wanted the pictures to look like pictures and we're using more of our basic tools. Um, so Replichrome, uh, you know, it kind of took listening to what, everyone wanted to kind of admit that, okay, maybe if we made something that was a little more subtle and simple, that people would uh, would like that. And, and it took a lot of trust to tell that people would be able to appreciate the subtle differences between each of the different presets. And, and, um, and yeah, and, you know, I, I like it too for the same reason. It's a good base. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't overpower the photos. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it gives them um, some some tone, uh, not tone, um, some character, some, some warmth. Um, in the same way that like a good pair of speakers will kind of accent the music without o overpowering it. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been great that way. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, developing these, um, I know there's quite a bit of science behind uh, mm -hmm. putting these presets together. You've gone through uh, test after test after test, going through film um, you know, emulsions and, mm -hmm. and sort of figuring out how you've come up with these um, these presets. I mean, it seems to have probably taken you a good year, maybe a year and a half or longer. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's been an ongoing project for a long time. Um, to to do something that was really true to film um, with digital photography, and you know, our earliest um, action set. I mean, TR, our, our first action set, TRA One from two thousand seven, had a couple of uh, filmy uh, presets that were meant to emulate the look of film in a kind of general way. Um, but yeah, it was kind of an on and off project for, for years and finally it just kind of got to the point where we said, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we need to do this now and, and do it right. Um, and so, yeah, it was a lot of, uh, two steps forward and one step back kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the, the process of building these ended up being a lot more art than science than I would have mm -hmm. liked. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reality is that trying to, to describe the character of a film is something that is really hard to do with just numbers. Um, so much of what people like has to do with things that the lab has done that are very human decisions and, and trying to take the art out of the process and make it all um, you know, boil down to algorithms and numbers um, was very frustrating and never really quite got us where we wanted. And it was finally when I kind of turned myself over to, okay, well, maybe I, I do need to just do this by eye um, within some kind of scientific controlled constraints um, that we started to get traction and started to see, you know, the results that I was looking for, which is, um, you know, consistent, repeatable, um, and accurate emulation of, of the way a lot of pe people's favorite neg, neg films look. Sure. Um, when it ca comes down to uh, Photoshop actions or presets, mm -hmm. are you now um, sort of leaning more towards presets only because you feel like it's got more control for photographers or do you feel like your Photoshop actions <laughs> also have, you know, I, I use your Photoshop actions every right. day. I'm not, just, I'm not just saying that because you're online. Yeah, yeah. It's because I, I use it every day. I mean, I, I use uh, yin yang and I use, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the old school uh, snap, uh, you yep. know, snap photo. I mean, those things are all going to be something that I'm going to use all the time. But mm -hmm. where, where do you feel like the, 
the industry is going. I mean, everybody's pretty much embraced Lightroom. Right. Uh, and it seems like photographers are more and more comfortable using it with presets or not, or just coming up with their own design, own presets. Um, and as we've already said, Replichrome is a wonderful way to just sort of get started and almost say, okay, well, I'm done, you know, kind of thing. Sure. Um, but what, what do you think about Photoshop Actions? Do you think those the, the era of Photoshop Actions are, is gone? Or do you feel like this well, is sort of an evolution for you? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, we can do, broadly speaking, a couple different things with Actions. Um, I mean, at its core, really an action enables you to do things that you'd otherwise be able to do in Photoshop just quicker and it makes it more repeatable. Um, so complicated processes of applying layer after layer and tweaking them just right uh, to be just so can be condensed to a single click and, and there's the value uh, there's value in that. Um, it still doesn't get over the fact that Photoshop is you know kind of a antiquated way um, of editing photos for the photographer that has a lot of photos to get through. It's great if you need to dive in and you really care about um, every little pixel and you know does things that no other program can do and does them very well um, but more and more especially busy wedding and portrait photographers are really embracing Lightroom um, as they should because that's really built to be a workflow program first and foremost and it becomes more and more capable um, you know the, the weird position we're in as a business is that you can only do so much with presets and um, I think Replichrome opens up kind of some new doors for us but I, I I see that being kind of, we'll exhaust that pretty quickly, um, all the different things you can do with presets. Because at the end of the day, um, presets in Lightroom really only uh, are good for color grading, as I like to say. You know, they, they can tweak a slider here or there, but they, they aren't, aside from making those kinds of, I, know, I have a several different complicated adjustments I want to apply to every photo, aside from making those kinds of things simpler and quicker and more repeatable, <laughs> um, they can't extend Lightroom in some of the ways people really would like. You know, it's up to Adobe to provide that to us. So, uh, in a way, it's great because it's this great uh, toolkit for us as developers to play with, and it's this this great um, uh, playground to to create new visions for for um, what a photo can look like. But it's also limited by what Adobe provides us um, in Lightroom and in Photoshop. So, um, in in a way, Photoshop has more. It's more developer friendly uh, because you can do plugins and you know there's this really rich interface to, to extend Photoshop. Yeah. Um, but Lightroom pretty much just gives you you know presets or send this photo to another app. So right. so we're uh, we're pursuing two different things. I mean we have RadLab and we're working on more RadLab like products which are more kind of standalone um, and more presets and actions as well. I think there's value in all of it. Do you feel uh, that uh, you know given that Photoshop had to grow up and has grown up in a, in quite some time? Uh -huh. You feel Lightroom is sort of in its infancy, and it's also going to allow you in the future to do those kinds of things that you feel like hasn't 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 been uh, that you have you yeah. haven't been able to do as such. Yeah, I don't know. I always you know it's, it's trying to decide what Adobe is going to do um, is always. I feel like Lightroom is maturing, and and the new kinds of features that we're seeing with excuse me, with every version are more evolutionary than revolutionary at this point. Right. Um, I feel like once they got the processing nailed down um, in Lightroom 4 and, you know, really, okay, we've solved the processing problems. Um, the other problems that they have left to solve with Lightroom are more ones of how convenient is it. Because you can get the results you want. Um, and you can even get them pretty quickly with, with presets. But I think for most people, they're like, oh, I want layers and I want it to not be slow. And... You know, Adobe's known for feature creep, and they're known for every version is a little slower and a little more memory and, and uh, disk space hungry and a little bit tougher to use because there's more and more stuff to navigate. So, I don't know. I kind of hope they'll continue to <laughs> make things worse in a way because it opens up op opportunities for us. Um, but, yeah, Adobe's products always just seem to get bigger and more complicated and more cumbersome as time goes on. Sure. Um, and Lightroom's going to have to. They have to sell more versions, you know? Yeah, most definitely. Um one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, clearly there's uh, competition out there for you. You know, yes. there, there's uh, Visco, and just more mm -hmm. recently, I've just heard of uh, something called the Factory Men, um, mm. which, you know, just came on board about two days ago. I found out about them, and okay. I was wondering, uh, you know, when it comes to competition, you were pretty good about, um, you know, coming out right off the bat with a, with a, with a 
a chart that sort of showed the differences between you and Visco. Right. Um, was that a marketing ploy on your part? <laughs> you know, in, in our particular case, I mean, part of, quite frankly, we, we looked at film emulation um, and said, we should do this, we should do this. Um, and we were really concentrating our efforts on, on Rad Lab for, for a while. And it took, you know, all of our efforts to kind of, that was an enormous engineering project to kind of get that going. And in the meantime, everyone's like, oh, we like, we like film emulation. And Visco had a lot of success with it. So that was kind of our, our um, okay, well, we're not going to let one company define what film looks like. Because I, I, I honestly felt like it's a great idea. And I think that it's been very popular. But I was, I was like, I don't remember film looking the way that Visco's photos looked, you know, like I shot plenty of film. And so I was like, okay, we're going to do this our way. We're going to do it right. Um, but as we home, like kind of uh, can converged on a solution for what this product was going to look like, we realized there's kind of one sensible way to do this in Lightroom, and it looks a lot like what Visco did. Um, so we wanted to be sure to highlight how our product was different, because um, I feel like they've done a very good job at saying, we are the film emulation company. Um, they practically don't have anything else going that doesn't kind of have that Visco look. Um, and again, when that aesthetic runs its course, I wonder what they're going to do since they've kind of, you know, pigeonholed themselves into we are the faded, uh, desaturated, you know, Seattle look company. Um, but that's their problem to deal with in the future. Our problem with Replichrome was was communicating to people how it was different and how it was better and how if you already had Visco, you should take a look at our product. Um, and you know, we kind of did that before knowing what the reaction would be. And as it turns out, people on their own without even seeing what the, the competitive, you know, we have more presets and our stuff's more accurate. Without even seeing that, they were like, oh yeah, I like this way more. Um, and a lot of the feedback was, this is just plain better. So maybe we didn't need to do it um, and we caught some heat for it, but um, yeah, I feel like it's a competitive world and um, if we're gonna have a product that's really similar, sure. it would be foolish not to, to show how ours is better. Because I do really believe it is, aside from just the, uh, the things you can put in a chart. What do you think is next for Replicrome? Uh, well, the uh, the obvious answer is to to do more. Um, there is a lot of film out there, um, and not just film that's available now, but film that was available in, in the past. Um, and the Replichrome that exists today concentrates on you know, professional color neg films for the most part um, that that are kind of modern emulsion. So. Um, yeah, I think we'll probably do a couple other sets, and uh, where it goes from there, I don't know. Okay. Um, but exploring other kinds of films, I, I've i bought so much film at this point. Um, it's all sitting in the fridge at home, but I mean, I literally, Shannon's like, no more film. Um, <laughs> but I, at this point, it's almost an obsession of like a, a film collector, you know, I've got sure. like some stuff coming from the UK right now, some like Panatomic X that expired in the 70s, and you know, oh, wow. all kinds of interesting stuff that... Um, I think because once you get beyond the stuff that photographers would be shooting today as film photographers, you kind of get into, well, what else is out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's well, kind of like cuisine. Right, right, right. You know, one of the one of the films that I would love to see, you know, you guys emulate is Type 55. That would be amazing. You know what? I'm going to put that on the list. I think, uh, I think Roger has some of that still. <laughs> Excellent. Very nice. Uh, it, it would be nice. I love that stuff too, back when you can actually get it. Um, yeah, I mean, again, but everyone's got their favorite, yes. and it's um, it's it's fun to try to to challenge yourself to make digital be true to that. It's it's fraught with all kinds of interesting compromises, and when it works, it's magic. It's really cool. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, don't you think though, even though you would produce something that you let's say we we are working on something on Type Fifty Five, yeah, uh, you know, you come up with something that sort of looks Type Fifty Five, but Somebody else remembers it being somewhere, somewhere else, or somehow. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's such a subjective thing, really. It, it is, and you know, the, the this is part of why I was my biggest problem as a business person is that I'm too damn honest. <laughs> you know, like if I, if I don't believe, uh, like marketers kind of bend the truth a little bit, and and you know, um, so for me it was like if we're gonna say this looks like film, then the criteria that I was holding myself to is this needs to look exactly like this film for every shooter in every situation. Ever. And it's not going to look that way. I finally had to let go of that in order sure. to produce something that worked for most people most of the time. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, I, I think I have a blog post on, on my blog that kind of talks about this, but even film doesn't look like film half the time. 
Um, that's part of why we love it. It's, it's kind of a surprise. You send it off to the lab, and right. even if you know this film intimately, once in a while you get something that you know isn't what you expect, and that's part of the beauty of it. Um, but it makes exact emulation a fool's errand. And, Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we had to let go of that a little bit. It's, it's been great, though. I mean, we've had a few people say, oh, it doesn't quite look this way, but with a couple tweaks, you can, you can really get it there for the most part. And um, Unless you're actually critically matching film to digital, then the point really is just to give you the character of those emulsions, and uh, you know the, the, the replichrome as exists can do that very well. Doug, thank you so much for your time. Uh, one thank last you. question for you, sure. and I'm sure my, my audience is going to be wondering, why are you dressed the way you are? <laughs> Well, uh, it, it's Halloween. I've got I've got my my Rick from Walking Dead Ooh. costume. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> um, are you supposed to look? I, uh, are you supposed to look scary though? Uh, I yeah, I don't know. Someone told me I needed more blood and grime and and uh, you know maybe some entrails hanging from my shoulders. So <laughs> um, you look next year. you look way too clean, my friend. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, and not like the apocalypse at all. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much, Doc. I appreciate your time. Thanks. And I look forward to having this interview posted on Tiffin Box in the next few days. Yeah, thanks so much. And it was, uh, it was great, to, great to catch up and touch base with you. Take care. Bye. All right, bye.